Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Yeah, it's a little unusual that I'm actually on camera for this because normally the second channel videos are just one camera shoots for minimal editing, maximum amount of video production speed. Uh, but this time it's a little bit different because I have an OBS setup on my lab bench here with multiple camera inputs and stuff. So I'm gonna be using this to actually make this video. And the nice thing about it is I can use OPS to switch inputs so we can look down on the bench here, uh, change inputs, actually record the desktop, things like that. Another little side note is um, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, so my voice is gonna sound a little bit strange. I have a bit of a sore throat. I feel okay otherwise, well, a little bit of a headache as well. It kind of feels like a very mild cold. So I'm gonna push through and I'm gonna make a video today because I wanna bring content to my viewers. Anyhow, on today's video, I'm gonna be looking at this motherboard right here. What's weird about this motherboard, and we'll take a closer look at it in a second, is it's a PC motherboard, as you can see. It's got ISA slots here as normal. It has two Visa local bus slots here, which doesn't seem that unusual. But what's unusual about this motherboard is that it's a 386SX processor. And a 386SX is essentially a 286 because it's got a 16-bit data bus and everything like that. Hence the fact that there are only two memory sticks in here because that is allowed with 16-bit data bus. But Visa local bus slots are 32 bits. Uh, they were primarily introduced on the 46 as a way to get faster access to the processor for video cards and hard drive interface cards, things like that. So I've never ever seen Visa local bus on a 386SX before. This would be essentially having Visa local bus on a 286. Doesn't really make sense. I'm assuming there are some kind of latches or something to allow this to work. I wanna see how this works and if there's even any performance benefits to using regular ISA cards, because I honestly don't believe that they're gonna be any at all. So first, let's take a closer look at this motherboard. Let's see, I have the uh, top down camera connected here. Let's get everything adjusted. Yeah, this is all stuff I normally edit out. So <laughs> you're gonna see some more of it. So this is the motherboard here. Let's see if we can see any uh, markings on it. So we have Leopard Rever Revision C there. Looks like there was some battery leakage there. That doesn't seem too bad. Zoom up a little bit more. I mean, I don't know. I haven't tested this motherboard, so it may or may not work, but looks like uh, if it doesn't work, this is fixable. Looks like someone just sort of ripped the battery right off there and left uh, part of the battery behind. But I think um, if this doesn't work, I'll just clean this up, but I have a feeling it's gonna work perfectly. Uh, looks like there's a little bit of corrosion right here on that IC, so we'll just have to clean that up. I'll do that before I power it up. Uh, like I said, we have two memory sticks installed. So of course, these types of 30-pin memory modules are eight bits wide. So on a 286, if it had SIM slots, you'd only need two of them because it's a 16-bit data bus. If you had 30-pin SIMs on an XT, you'd only need one at a time. Now, of course, uh, on a 486, you're gonna need four at a time. And if you could put 30-pin SIMs on a Pentium, a Pentium has a 64-bit data bus, which means, of course, you would require eight at a time. Let's turn the board around. Looks like we have a copyright 1993 right here. This thing obviously has cache memory. Here it is. Um, the CY7C199s. I'm gonna have to look up how big these cache chips are. Uh, looks like we have a jumper right here. This is probably a tag memory, and obviously only half the cache memory is installed. This board is sporting the Opti chipset here, 82C295. There's another chip right there as part of the chipset. And there is the BIOS chip, and it says 46 SLC ISA BIOS. Now, 46 SLC is just a 36SX with a 46 core on it. I think Cyrix made that. Intel never made such a chip. And like I mentioned, remember that a 36SX is actually just a 286 with a couple extra signals, but generally a 286 and a 36SX are the same. They both have the same external data bus on them, which is 16-bit. They both um, max out at a total of 16 megabytes of RAM just because of the amount of pins on there. And I think that chipsets that are designed to work on the 36SX can actually work with a 286 chip generally. Now there is the chip, and of course it has this heat sink that's glued on, so we can't easily see what it is. But we're gonna make the assumption that this is a 46SLC 
And if the machine is working, when we boot it up, we'll actually see that. Now, right here, we have a math coprocessor. And yes, the coprocessor, the math coprocessor for the 386SX does have a bit different package than the 286. 286 math coprocessor is a 40 pin dip. And this is the one for the 386SX. And this is the 87SLC33, which would imply that this is a 33 megahertz 486SLC, which means it's a 386SX that runs at 33 megahertz. Here we are with the Visa local bus slots. <laughs> How is this possible? I don't know. But take a look at these chips right here. These are 344s, which we're going to have to look up what that is exactly. It's a 74 LS chip, I think. Um, these may be some type of latches. And a latch would allow you to, for instance, interface an 8-bit device to a 16-bit data bus or vice versa. Now we take a look here, this is my XT IDE card. Let me zoom out a little bit more on this. So this of course has an 8-bit ISA bus connector, but it's hooked up to a compact flash or a regular IDE connector here. And this is a 16-bit bus. So this uses a couple latches here, which I think are these chips here, which if we try to look at the markings on there, it's really hard to see. Let me zoom up. Those are 673s, which I think are a version of the latch. A 373 is also a latch. And these allow 16 bits from this to be held in a temporary buffer and then sent over the 8-bit bus one at a time. So it sort of takes one 16-bit request, breaks it up into two 8-bit ones, and then sends one of them over the 8-bit bus and then the other one. And we have these, which are what, 18? uh 18 cy8 i have a feeling these are like pal chips or something so this is just some logic probably to make this all work my assumption though with this visa local bus is that there is actually no performance benefit because it's going to take each 32-bit request break it up into two uh 16-bit requests kind of like the xt ide card is doing with these latches here and then send them to the processor one at a time Let's take a look at the data sheets for the 286 and the 386SX to kind of compare the pinouts on them. So this is a 286 right here. It's a PLCC chip. And what, how many pins does it have? It looks like it has 68 pins. And this right here is a 386SX. And it looks like this does have more pins. Uh, here we go. It has 100 pins. Now, even though it's got more pins, I don't think there's actually a big difference between them because notice here, VCC, VCC, VSS, there's a whole lot of VCC and VSS pins on the 386SX. And if we go back to the 286, there aren't so many of those extra pins. Um, in fact, where's VCC and VSS on this? There's VCC, there's one. VSS is right there. And that's it. Oh, there's a couple over here as well. But there aren't duplicates over and over again of those two pins, which there are on this. Now, when we take a look at 36SX, the uh, address lines go from A1 to A23. Now, much like any other 16-bit processor, there's no A0 line, and that's because uh, when you make a single read from memory, you're actually reading uh, A0 and A1 at the same time because, you know, 8 bits, 8 bits, 16 bits, you don't need that extra address line 0. And then there are the data lines, D0 through D15, so 16 bits. There's absolutely no way you can get 32 bits in and out of a 386SX without having two requests, which is why it's a lot slower than a 386DX, because that, and like the 486, is a true 32-bit processor when it comes to the external data bus. A 386SX is a 32-bit processor internally. It just can't communicate to the world with a full 32 bits. And it's exactly like the 8088, both the 8088 and 8086 are 16-bit processors internally, but the 8086 is the only one that can communicate externally with 16 bits, while the 8088 is limited to only 8 bits. Now notice on the 36SX how many pins are VCC and VSS. As I said, they used, well, they wasted a lot of pins for that, and then there's a bunch of not connected pins. There are 19 control lines on the 36SX, and let's go to the data sheet. I have to look around the camera there. Let's go to the data sheet for the 286 and see if we can figure out how many control lines exist on this chip. I think there's 18. I might have miscounted, but the there were 19 on the 386SX and there are 18 on the 286. Like I said, I'm pretty sure the chipsets that are designed for the 386SX can almost always run with the 286 as well because it's pretty much the same processor. Maybe there's that one extra signal, whatever that might be. Uh, that would cause it not to work, but I think it would work. I'd be really curious to see if anyone's ever made an adapter that goes from a 286 to a 386. Anyhow, back to this motherboard with this 36SX or 46 SLC processor on here. It just seems completely silly that there are Visa local bus slots on here because I really 
just don't see how this can be faster than ISA. There's one possibility that could lead to a performance improvement. The ISA bus typically maxes out around eight megahertz. Typically the ISA bus, when it was first released on the IBM PC AT was locked to the CPU speed. So the original AT had a six megahertz bus. So ISA ran at six megahertz. And then later there was an eight megahertz AT and then this ran at eight megahertz. Typically ISA buses don't generally run faster than eight megahertz. It can often work if you overclock it, but most motherboards, even if the processor runs say at 33 megahertz, like this motherboard, I think, then it does a clock divider for the ISA bus. And that means the ISA bus is a lot slower than the processor because the 33 megahertz processor sitting around waiting for the ISA bus all the time if it's talking to peripherals that are on here. Maybe with the Visa local bus on here, even though it's gotta take two clock cycles for every read or write to the Visa local bus because it's gonna be using latches, maybe it's gonna be running at 33 megahertz. So the effective speed is 16 megahertz, which is still twice as fast as the ISA bus on this particular motherboard. Now, looking at these chips again, I earlier thought that they were, uh, I don't know, 344s, but clearly these are LSF245s. These are just bus transceivers. I'm not sure what I was thinking earlier. I just uh, misread them. Now, the fact there are four bus transceivers here might imply that the chipset or even the CPU can actually use these as sort of a pseudo latch. So while it's trying to read or write from this 32-bit source, it very quickly activates two of these to read, like say the lower 16 bits, and then it activates the other two to read the upper 16 bits, which will add up to 32 bits. There are a couple signals on the 36SX BHE and BLE, and byte enables indicate which data bytes the data bus take part in a bus cycle. I'm wondering if this has something to do with the ability for it to read the high or low part of the 32 bits uh, on the Labisa local bus slots. And over on the 286 data sheet, there is no BLE, only a BHE signal. Bus high enable indicates transfer of data to the upper byte of the data bus, 15 to eight. Eight bit oriented devices are assigned the upper byte of the data bus, we normally use BHE to condition chip select functions. BHE active load floats three states. So yeah, I wonder if that's the actual difference. That might be the one signal that the 386SX has over the 286, and maybe that is utilized to access 32-bit resources. Oh, and you know what? Take a look at this. BLE and BHE, there's a little table here that sort of shows how they, it works. And take a look at the 286 one. It's exactly the same, except BLE uses the address line zero, which is omitted entirely on the 36SX. And I guess Intel just changed the name of that signal to uh, BLE. Okay, so obviously it's not those two signals that allow the Beats of Local Bus 32-bit transfers to work. So there's some other way that it happens and it could easily be happening inside of the chipset on this motherboard and has nothing to do with the uh, pins on the CPU itself. So yeah, it's a little bit of a mystery how this A works and B, why it's here and if there are actually any performance improvements on this board. When I got this motherboard, this Trident video card was actually plugged into it. I'm assuming this was used in whatever uh, system this was in. And this card, I tested it and it does work. So we can use this to check the performance of this versus, let's grab this other motherboard I have sitting right here, versus this board right here, which is a 486. Um, this is actually, I think, a DX266 in here. As you notice, this actually has local bus slots as well. It's obviously a lot faster than this being a 33 megahertz board. Well, at least that's what we think it is based on the uh, Mathco processor here. But I have an ISA Trident card here, and we can compare that to this local bus one. In fact, uh, let me grab my goggles here. Uh, this is a TGUI 9400, and this is an 8900. Okay, so that's not apples to apples comparison because the local bus card here actually has some video acceleration on it, and this one here, the ISA one, doesn't. But either way, we can kind of get a rough idea. I don't think I have uh, an ISA version of this card. Anyways, like I said earlier in the video, it is a 46 that much more, well, more typically would have a local bus connector because once you got to the 46 or that full 32 bits, it started to become a real bottleneck that you were stuck with slow eight megahertz ISA for things like video cards and hard drive interface cards. So they added this for, uh, to give that big performance improvement. There were 386DX motherboards that were also released with local bus slots. And of course that works because a DX, 386DX actually has 32 bits, 
but there were also Pentium boards that had these slots and that I think was a bit of a bodge and didn't work very well or uh, there wasn't a huge performance improvement. Also, Pentiums had a much higher speed front side bus, typically 60 megahertz, 66 megahertz, things like that, and up on later socket sevens. And Visa local bus seems to kind of max out around 33 megahertz. It is possible to run them up to 50 megahertz because there are some 46s that can run at that front side bus, but it's kind of unreliable to do that. I think that's violating the spec. The spec, I think, is 33 megahertz on this. That's what I've always heard. Most Pentium boards had PCI slots, which also ran at 33 megahertz. And I actually don't really know, and I'd be curious to hear in the comment section, if you're familiar with Pentiums with local bus connectors, was it pretty much comparable performance-wise to PCI, because they're both probably running at 33 megahertz, or did you lose performance to local bus? I'm not sure I have any Pentium boards that have local bus, so I've never been able to test that. So I think at this point, first thing we need to do is test this motherboard out. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick in this ISA card here first. I'll we'll stuck that in here, like so. I have my power supply here, which I use typically as my motherboard stand. So we'll connect up the power connector here. Just for fun, since it's the first time I've ever powered up this motherboard, I'm gonna use my postcard. So we'll stick that in here as well. Hook up the speaker that's on the postcard, like so. Uh, let's see, what's next? Uh, I will not plug my XT IDE in, but I will plug in this video cable here that goes to my capture device so you can see what happens. I have switched inputs, so we're looking at the capture device, but you can kind of see what's coming in from the camera here. And let's turn it on. Okay, it's posting. Sounds unhappy though, but uh, we're stuck at a postcode of D. I'm gonna take this memory out because I don't know if this memory is working and I'm gonna stick in four one megabyte memory modules. That way, um, in case these two slots need to be occupied, oh, let me switch cameras so you can see what I'm pointing to. In case these two slots need to be occupied, it should work. Not to mention we'll rule out that this memory might be bad. Here we have some Samsung one meg modules. I have tested these, so I know these are good. Let's see if this powers up now. No, we're still getting D as the code. Let's take this video card out. I don't think that's the sound for a bad video card. It's funny, this, it's running at a different frequency now. Hmm. It's a video card in, it's a higher pitched beep, but we're still stuck at that same postcode. Stopped beeping. Well, I don't think this thing is working, that is for sure. There is no video output whatsoever. Let's take a look at RetroWeb, see if we can find what this motherboard is. I'm gonna shut it off because it's just sort of beeping continually here. I have to start with Chipset Opti. This is an 82C295. Here it is, PCAT says it is combined with the 82C206, which is exactly what is on here. So those are them. And for narrowing down the search, because we don't know the brand name, oops, there is one 8-bit ISA slot. We have seven ISA, we have seven 16-bit ISA slots. And where is VLB? And here is VLB, we have two. So let's uh, hit that search button, search. Aha, okay. That, is that it right there? Uh, wait, these look the same. Oh, Leopard, Rev C, that's what we saw on there. Look at this, Leopard, Rev A, B, and C. These are them. These are them. Look at this, it's got the Mathco processor, it has the little Heat sink on there, that is it, that is it. Oh, shoot, I lost it. Let's uh, search again, and yeah, let's take a look. I'm hoping to see that there are some jumpers on here that we can configure just so I can double check that this stuff is correct. Also known as the IBM 220. IBM 220, okay. There are a couple different BIOS images that I could download, that's pretty nice. Let's take a look at the manual here. Okay, yeah, this is definitely the motherboard here. So let's see here, factory configuration. 
I'm gonna go and double check that all the jumpers are correct on this. Okay, it looks like all the jumpers are configured correctly. It's configured for 64K of cache that supports up to 128. And these are the CPU speed configuration and it supports 50 or 66 megahertz. I think the CPU must be clock doubled. Therefore, it's running at a 33 megahertz bus, which coincides with the 33 megahertz uh, math code processor here. There's some other jumpers that are like factory configured, open, close, that kind of thing. And those are all configured correctly. And therefore, the fact that it's beeping here, um, I'm going to have to double check probably to see what's going on with this leakage here, because maybe that's what caused some damage there to keep this thing from working. So I'm going to grab some vinegar and a little brush, and I'm going to start scrubbing away and just clean up that mess there. Well, I did some inspection of the motherboard, and I didn't see any kind of broken traces. I cleaned it up using vinegar and uh, IPA. Uh, there's a little bit of corrosion on this IC right here. I think it's a LS245, so maybe that chip is damaged, but none of the traces look damaged at all. And the bottom side of the board also looks completely perfect. I pulled the BIOS chip out of the motherboard. You can see there that um, it is missing. And I downloaded one of the BIOS images from RetroWeb and I compared it by loading it into the, uh, the EEPROM programmer software here. And I did a verify with the actual chip installed in the programmer, the one from the motherboard, and actually verifies perfect. So this uh, chip that was on the motherboard is not bad at all. And if I turn this back on, same thing. I have the speaker disconnected, but it's stopping at D. Now I counted the number of beeps and it was 10. And there is a web page that has the beep codes. I'll get to that in a second, but looking here at D, refresh, check, okay. So I'm assuming uh, this means, um, well, I'm never quite sure what this means. When it shows D, did it fail on this one, system timer started, or did it fail on refresh check, which I think has to do with the DRAM. Taking a look at the beep codes on this different web page, uh, it says 10 is CMOS battery. I, I don't know what, how to replace the battery. What? It seems to imply that 10 beeps have to do with the CMOS battery. I've never found an old motherboard that actually didn't work when you didn't have a battery installed. You just get, well, the BIOS loses its um, information. I just pulled the memory out of this, hooked up the speaker. Let's see if that changes at all. No. We're still getting D and we're still getting um, the same beep code exactly. So I'm really thinking that maybe this chip right here did get damaged from the battery leakage or something here is damaged and the RAM is not working. Before I call it quits on this motherboard, at least for now, is I'm gonna desolder this chip right here and I'll install a new one and let's see if that makes any difference whatsoever. Alrighty, well, um, that escalated quickly. Things aren't going so well. I did take out and replace the IC that I thought might be bad. This is the one that had the corrosion on it. I did test the IC outside of the motherboard and everything completely worked fine. In the tester, I used the Mini Pro. Not the best tester in the world, but did show that it was working. I did try a different chip in here that didn't make a difference. Now, you might be noticing the BIOS has been replaced on here and you might be noticing the power supply is open. That is because once I took this chip out, first I tested it without any chip on there, and the motherboard was powered up and it wasn't doing anything on the postcard, didn't see any activity. So it like wasn't executing any code. Now it could well be that this chip here talks to the BIOS chip and without it, um, the keyboard IC here and the BIOS wasn't working. So therefore you're not gonna get any code. But while that was out, the machine was powered on with the power supply here. Of course the lid was on it. And I started hearing weird noises coming from the power supply like sparking sounds and then a burning smell and on the postcard it has the different voltage rails here. They started flickering and looking really weird. And I shut the power supply off. And even with it unplugged from the motherboard, this power supply no longer works. Now I opened up this power supply, take a look inside, see if I saw anything visibly wrong, like burned or scorch marks, and I don't. But I did smell that burning smell from inside here when I opened it up. And now when I turn it on, you get like five volt rail at three volts or two volts and the, the 12 volt rails around five volts or and there's weird hissing noise so something weird is going on and the funny thing about this power supply i've used this a lot this thing has automatic shutdown so it has overcurrent protection if something happens like say there's a shorted tantalum on the motherboard this thing just shuts off altogether which is really nice but clearly this thing is very unhappy now that part of the circuit's not working or i don't know what's going on unfortunately we have another power supply here this is a king pow version this is 
the, obviously an XT power supply, but it's pretty powerful. I think it's 200 watts or 150 watts or something like that. With it plugged into this motherboard in the original chip back in here, when we turn this on, the computer no longer does anything. Basically, it's not coming out a reset. There's a reset light right here, which needs to go off to say that the machine should be executing code and it's always stuck in reset. If I turn off the power, turn it back on, that's it. Now uh, you might notice here, I've taken the uh, math code processor out thinking that something might've happened to that. I swapped back and forth between two different chips here, the 245s, no change there. Made sure everything was, was pushed down properly, no changes. The reset header, which is right here, is not shorted or anything like that. And in fact, um, if I touch it together, there's absolutely no change um, on the reset LED on the postcard. So something bad has happened to this motherboard that's just holding it in reset and there's no way it's gonna work. The reason I have a new BIOS chip on here is I made a new copy. Um, I don't know where it is, but the original chip that was in the board, after that incident with the power supply, I put it back into the Mini Pro here and I did a verify and it didn't verify. Oh, here's the chip right here. This is it. It no longer verified properly. It had at least one byte that was changed. So I don't know, I thought that that might make a difference, but to be honest, um, you know, the fact that it's stuck in reset has nothing to do with the BIOS chip. And yeah. Now I also noticed that this Opti chip right here, and if we zoom in right here, this chip right here had a little bit of corrosion, strangely enough, right on this pin right here. There was a green blob there and it actually corroded so badly it lost contact with the motherboard. And I went ahead and I bodged it onto the VIA that it went to and now there's continuity and I went and double checked that all the other pins were good and they are. Um, I don't know where the corrosion would have come from over here. It's pretty far away from the battery. Nonetheless, uh, that is now connected and that didn't make any kind of difference at all. I think that was already disconnected and might have actually been the entire problem with the refresh or the RAM not working originally was that, that lifted pin there. So it's really unfortunate that I didn't inspect the board first and see that, but I suppose if that power supply died, it would have died anyways. And you know, if that damaged this motherboard, well, that would have happened nonetheless. It's always a little bit of a worry of mine when you have these old power supplies, like theoretically they could go bad and damage stuff by maybe putting in a voltage that's too high or something like that. Like the EEPROM works still, it just doesn't read properly, which I think is pretty weird. I can't really test too much else on here because everything is soldered except for this one Tagram chip here but that is not on the reset line. So whatever handles reset on this board has been damaged and it's probably the chipset, although the CPU is on the reset line as well. So the CPU could have, could have gone bad as well. While editing this video, I thought about what might be holding the machine in reset. And I realized that the power supply outputs a power good signal, which the computer looks at or compares to, to figure out if the power supply is stable and then it brings the computer out of reset. So I traced that pin on the ATX power connector and it went to this little IC U42 and it turned out that IC had gone bad. It was shorting the input pin to ground uh, at about 10 ohms. So I actually removed it from the board with hot air and then I replaced it with another one I found off with another motherboard. And unfortunately it cured the problem with the reset being stuck on, but it did not allow the machine to boot. It still had no postcodes. So something else is wrong with the computer as well. Probably was damaged when the power supply went bad. So what can I say? It's a real bummer that this uh, motherboard is no longer working and this is not a satisfying video. I was really hoping to try to get this thing working so we could test the performance of this 386SX with VLB. So I'm putting a question out to my viewers. If you've ever used a motherboard like this and you have experience using these slots, like how fast are they compared to ISA and compared to actual 486s or 386DXs with VLB? Is it worthwhile to even use these slots or what? If you have any thoughts and ideas of how to get this board working, definitely comment down below. But without having another one of these to compare against, it's, uh, it's gonna be pretty difficult. So I think that's gonna be it for this video. Thumbs up if you liked it. Thanks to my patrons, their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, put your comments down below. And I hope that this video worked out with this new setup for second channel videos. It's definitely my first time trying it. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.